Good morning, everyone. Whether you uh, worship with us regularly or whether you're here with us for the first time, a very warm welcome to followers of the way this morning. And I do apologize in advance because I have a touch of laryngitis and I know my voice is a little strange. Um, so it's fine. Uh, but please excuse me if I do have a drink of water occasionally and um, just ignore it. Well, um, today is, of course, Palm Sunday. And we remember and celebrate Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But we know that only a few short days after that triumphal entry, just as he'd known would happen, Jesus was going to face betrayal and rejection with the crowds calling for his death. And that says something about humanity, doesn't it? Because moods, whether they're individual or collective, they can change very, very quickly. And I think that's something that we've seen this week, haven't we? With the Princess of Wales shock announcement that she's being treated for cancer. And over the last week, the conspiracy theories surrounding Kate have grown more and more outlandish. And I'm sure you'd all have heard some of the more bizarre ones. And I think there must have been incredibly intrusive and cruel, given what the family's actually been going through. But terrible things have been suggested about her and William on social media, and there's been so much criticism. And now, of course, following that announcement, there's nothing but sympathy, and rightly so. But we do do well to remember, I think, how easily we can all rush to unfounded, unthinking, and actually really cruel judgments. So today and over the coming days, we pray for Kate. We pray for the family, pray that her treatment will be 100% successful and that she will be restored to full health very quickly. And we pray for the king too, of course, because he too is undergoing the same sort of treatment at this time. And let's pray that for both of them, through their experiences now, they will come to know God and Jesus Christ his one and only son. Let's pray for goodness out of all this suffering. Well, that said, we are very pleased to have with us again this morning, Paul Luckraft as our speaker. And Paul is continuing his series, looking at the Jewishness of Jesus. And his theme this morning is Jesus, our Emmanuel. Sorry, I just had a quick thought. I was thinking Emmanuel, God with us, but it's Jesus, our Emmanuel. I'm very much looking forward to what Paul has to say. And there are no breakout rooms today after the service, because again, Paul has very kindly, very bravely offered to stay with us to uh, just uh, meet with everybody to answer questions, to discuss, listen to comments and everything. So Paul, welcome again. And thank you. And as we come to worship now, let's just take a moment to still our hearts and minds before we just offer our time together now to the Lord. Father of light, we welcome you. We praise your holy name. And we ask now, Holy Spirit, that you will come that you will lead us by your power to hear what it is that you have to say to us this day, to draw closer to you, to come into your presence. Lord, may our worship be acceptable in your sight. And Lord, be glorified in all we say and do. So please, we offer you our praise, our thanksgiving. Be with us now. Go before us for the praise and glory of Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a world that... that I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> We're going to have a time of worship now, and Jane is going to lead us. Thank you. Jane, over to you. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you this morning. You are our Emmanuel. You are God with us. And we worship you this morning. We bless you. We praise you. 
Thank you, Lord, for who you are and for all that you've done for us. Thank you. The sign shall be given, a virgin will conceive, a human baby bearing undiminished deity. The glory of the nations, a light for all to see, and hope for all who will embrace his warm reality. Emmanuel, our God is with us, and if God is with us, who could stand against us? Our God is with us, Emmanuel. For all those who live in the shadow of death, a glorious light has dawned for all those who stumble in the darkness behold your light has come Emmanuel our God is with us and if God is with us who could stand against us our God is with us Emmanuel so what will be your answer will you hear the call of him who did not spare his son but gave him for us all on earth there is no power there is no depth or height that could ever separate us from the love of god in christ emmanuel our god is with us and if god is with us who could stand against us our god is with us emmanuel emmanuel our god is with us and if god is with us who could stand against us our God is with us, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, his name is called Emmanuel.
red redeemer, living word, Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Blessed Redeemer, living word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jane. Emmanuel, God with us. If God is with us, who can stand against us? That is a lesson that society would do well to learn today because we have collectively seem to have rebelled against God in so many ways, and we are in such a mess. We know that we all fall short of the glory of God. We all know that we have things to bring before the Lord to confess. But I invite you today to, as we stand together, to stand on behalf of our nation, to confess the ways in which we have so arrogantly rebelled against him and asserted our own control over the land and how we have so damaged the land and life through that. So as we come before the Lord, let us consciously join together in spirit and stand in the gap to repent and to ask the Lord's mercy. So please stay silent, but join with me now in making this confession to Almighty God, to God with us. Almighty God, our Father, we come to you with humble hearts to confess our sins. For the times when we have turned away from you, ignoring your will for our lives, Father, forgive us, save us and help us for prioritizing our own selfish desires and behaving as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For failing you, not only by what we do, but also by our thoughts and words. Father, forgive us, save us and help us for letting ourselves be drawn away from you by the temptations of the world. Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. For the times when, by our words and actions, we have denied before others your sovereignty and the lordship of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. Father, we have failed you often and now humbly ask your forgiveness. Help us so to live that others may see your glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we make that confession, trusting in the Lord's love that seeks always to save those who are lost, that searches after those who are lost, knowing that when we turn to him in repentance, then his love surrounds us and heals us. So again, we pray this absolution for the land. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us now to new life 
in Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite Karen now to come and give us our reading. Karen, please. So our first reading today is from Isaiah 7, verses 1 to 17. And I'm reading from the RSV. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezan, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remalia, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but they could not conquer it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, his heart and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go forth to meet Ahaz, you and Shera Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smouldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remalia. Because Syria, with Ephraim and the son of Remalia, has devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is risen. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken to pieces so that it will no longer be a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil, and choose the good, the land before those whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days has, as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So the second reading comes from Matthew 21 verses 1 to 11. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. Ah. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. 
they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Karen. Well, it's a very great pleasure to have Paul back with us now as he continues this series. And we're really looking forward to what you have to share with us, Paul. Let's just um, ask the Lord's blessing now as he, as he comes to speak. Lord, we just lift up Paul to you. We thank you that you have led him and guided him in these ways, Lord, over the years. We thank you for the wisdom that you've given to him. And we pray now for your anointing that your voice will speak through him. Lord, as he unfolds your word to us, we pray that we will come closer to you and hear what it is that you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the readings. Thank you for uh, everybody else that's taken part. Now, you may be wondering uh, from those two readings uh, how they connect with each other. And the answer is, well, they don't. Not really. I've set myself the task of doing two things today. Um, partly because, first of all, it's Palm Sunday, and I didn't want to ignore that. So uh, later on, we will be focusing on the, the second reading, uh, and in particular, the uh, the event it describes, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. But the reason for the first reading was because uh, last time, a month ago, you may think, oh, we've already had that, we had that a month ago. Yes, you did, but I didn't have time to get round to it, so I had to sort of postpone it until now. So there's two things going on uh, today, but both within the common theme of Matthew's use of the Old Testament and those verses or passages where he starts with a special formula, which says all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. So there's two more of those today. We looked at three last time, all in Matthew chapter two. And the idea was to go back to the one in chapter one, but I uh, ran out of time as I thought indeed I would. So a bit of a recap first of all of what is going on here generally, what Matthew is actually doing, because when he's writing up the, the story of Jesus, the Jesus he's come to know, he's trying to find greater significance about that story from what happened in the past and what God did then. And so he keeps talking about fulfillment, which for Matthew is not about, well here's a prediction and look it's come true, but it's much more in terms of the bigger picture of what God has promised through Israel and through his covenants in terms of his overall plan of salvation. Matthew is looking back in order to bring to bear, bring to bear on the story of Jesus what God has done uh, in the past. And so he uses this first this this term uh, fulfillment uh, more as the consummation of promise rather than just the verification of a prediction and he's trying to show us that God himself in the person of Christ has actually fulfilled everything that he promised in the past so he can refer to events which in themselves don't carry any explicit future prediction we saw that in one or two of them last time where he uh, refers to Hosea uh, saying about God bringing Israel out of Egypt because Jesus went into Egypt and came back again, but Hosea wasn't predicting that as such. But uh, Matthew finds a link between what God did in the past and again in Jesus, who came to complete the Old Testament and all God's promises in this deeper sense of fulfilling them. Matthew is looking for greater levels of significance than were written before, not just isolated uh, predictions because he does believe that that's what Jesus in particular came to do. So um, we read again from Isaiah chapter 7 in order to refer then to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23 or 22 and 23, 
which I say we didn't look at last time. So if you've got Matthew open, uh, ready for what we're going to look at later, then you just need to flick back to chapter one, where, again, we get this nice little formula to remind us what Matthew is doing. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which Matthew then kindly explains to us means God with us. And you might have got a footnote that says, oh, yes, refer back to Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. But very rarely do people actually do that. And very rarely do they actually try and sort of connect it and see what was going on in the past there. So Matthew is picking out this verse for one very good reason. But it's a strange reason because Matthew quotes there and they will call him Emmanuel. And yet they never did call Jesus Emmanuel. That wasn't his name. It wasn't even a nickname. It wasn't even a name that came to him later. And it also seems to contradict what Matthew has already said in the previous verse. You are to give him the name Jesus. And for the very good reason that it means saviour and he will save his people from their sins. So why is he now saying, oh, there's another name instead? Well, we'll see in a minute uh, quite where that comes from. The other strange thing about it is that in uh, Matthew 1, 23, he says, they will call him Emmanuel. Now, in the, uh, the text that was, that was read out, and it was interesting to see a different version being read, I think, from what was on the screen uh, some of the time, which is great. That, that didn't cause any problems at all. Um, in fact, it highlighted one or two things. But back in the Old Testament, in the, in the version in, uh, in Isaiah, it doesn't say they will call. It either says you will call or even in Hebrew, she will call, meaning the mother will call his name, Emmanuel. So why is uh, Matthew changing it? Well, firstly, perhaps to avoid contradicting the fact that his name was Jesus, but also because he's going to bring a different point uh, out of that. Now, back in Isaiah, then, the biggest story that we read from in chapter 7 was that this was a sign being given at a particular time to a particular person about a particular set of circumstances. So primarily, we have to go back into the 8th century, back into Israel and to the time of King Ahaz and see what was going on. And if you uh, worked your way through the complications of all those names and places Basically, it boiled down to that Israel was in trouble. Israel felt threatened. It was a time of impending war and international tension. Uh, things don't change much there, do they, from that point of view? And I think it said that Ahaz was shaken. They were very frightened as to what was going to happen. And they really wondered if God was going to be with them in this time. And so I, Isaiah comes along and he makes uh, a prediction and he offers Ahaz a sign. And Ahaz says, no, I don't want a sign. But Isaiah says, well, you're going to get one anyway. Uh, and so he makes this prediction about a child that will be born. Now, when Isaiah makes that uh, prediction of a child, this is something that was going to happen very soon or within the time period that it was needed in order to make sense for Ahaz and the people at the time. This is not a long distance prediction of a Messiah. Uh, th this particular verse or passage was never regarded as a messianic prophecy in Jewish circles then or indeed later. Uh, Matthew was going to pick it up for one very good reason. And in the reading that we had, uh, it was very clear because it was uh, accurately translated that Isaiah actually didn't say that a virgin would conceive but a young woman would conceive. Because if Isaiah had actually said virgin, you might be thinking, oh, was there a virgin birth before Jesus? And the answer is no, and that's not what he's actually saying. Now, what uh, he, the word he's using is a young woman and someone who is yet to be married and who therefore would be a virgin at the time in which he spoke. But at the time in which the birth took place, she would by then have been married gone through the usual process of producing her first child. If Isaiah had wanted 
to talk specifically about a virgin giving birth, then he had a different Hebrew word that he could have used. But he did say young woman in order to make it clear that although she was a virgin at that time, one day, very soon, she would be married and produce a child. And then before this child gets very old, described as before he really knows how to choose between good and evil, then Judah's enemies will have been destroyed. And that was the sign that God was going to be with his people. It's not known who that child was. Presumably, he actually was called Emmanuel. Other speculations are that uh, it might have been one of Isaiah's own children and so on. But again, they weren't called Emmanuel. So it's much better to think of it as someone relatively unknown, but who by the time that child was born and reached early childhood, God had uh, destroyed destroyed Israel's uh, enemies. So it was a prophecy for the time, a prediction that was fulfilled very soon after it was given in the time of Israel and so on. So why does uh, Matthew want to pick this up? Well, Matthew obviously sees a little bit of a, a link here with the fact that a young woman who at the time was a virgin and Mary was herself a virgin at the time of birth. But Matthew's application here in from Isaiah 714 is not an attempt to establish or to prove that somehow Jesus was born of a virgin. That was already known. It, that was a given. I don't think Matthew was at all trying to establish that. That was already known. What interests him is that he would be called Emmanuel. And Matthew's primary focus in these verses is not to uh, establish the miraculous conception of Jesus, but how Jesus brought God to us in a unique way. He's trying to establish very early on that Jesus' whole life, his whole ministry, and everything about him was a God with us situation. And that theme will run all the way through Matthew's gospel. And if you remember how it ends, the words of Jesus, uh, the end is when he said to go into all the world and all the nations and make disciples, teach them everything. He says, and I am with you. I am still Emmanuel. So he was never called Emmanuel, but that was how he came to be understood, recognized, known and indeed received by people once they got to know him. It was to be more than a name. It was to be more than just let's call him Emmanuel. He literally was Emmanuel uh, all the way through from birth right through to the time he left them and beyond. It's a theme, if you like, rather than the title. It's the means by which people would get to see something about Jesus once they got to know him, once they followed him, once they did what he said. In other words, it was part of his ministry and his mission rather than just a birth name. So Matthew is doing this sort of thing, as he does all the time. He's finding these links, he's finding these connections, and he goes back to a prophecy which was not a messianic, messianic prophecy, but it was something that came true then, and he's drawing something out from there in order to establish something deeper, really, about Jesus that we wouldn't otherwise have. Jesus is fulfilling everything that God has ever said and done uh, and wants to do. So that's to um, to pick up where I uh, was going to do last time and, and didn't have time, is to look at how that first one of those, uh, what we call um, the fulfillment formula, fulfillment quotations, actually works out and how it links in to the reading in, in Isaiah chapter 7. Now, I want to move uh, now to the second bit, the Palm Sunday bit. And for this, uh, we need to now go to Matthew 21, which is the other reading. <clears throat> now, I'd say I've jumped ahead because altogether there's about 10 of these different quotations that Matthew uses. And this actually is the ninth. So having done the second, third and fourth last time, jumped back to the first one and now jumping ahead to the ninth one simply because of where we're at today. Uh, and we'll pick up the others uh, another time. So what we have in the middle of the reading that uh, we had from 
Matthew chapter 21, is in verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And verse 5 is a quotation, and it might tell you in your footnote that you should look up Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9 if you want to find out exactly who that prophet was and what Matthew is doing here. So by all means, do that. If you can keep your finger in both Matthew 21 and go back to Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, that would be worth doing. Because we're going to see again that Matthew is actually wanting to pick up something and he will change it a little bit for his own purposes. Just like he changed the Emmanuel bit to they shall call him Emmanuel, meaning anybody and everybody will be able to see who he is. He's Emmanuel rather than just she, a mother, will give that name to a, a child. But I ought to warn you that what Matthew is actually doing here is he's putting together bits from two different prophets. So if you do look up Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, you'll find it doesn't quite match exactly what uh, Matthew is quoting in chapter 21 and verse 5. And for that, you also need Isaiah 62 and verse 11. Now, if you haven't got another finger, don't worry, because I'm about to read that. In Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 11, it says, The Lord has made proclamation to the ends of the earth. Say to daughter Zion, see your saviour comes. So Matthew is picking that up as a little sort of prediction about Jesus. Say to daughter Zion, see your saviour comes. So he starts off, say to daughter Zion, see and then he changes it to your king comes because of what it says in Zechariah chapter 9, which says, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. So there's another link. Uh, the, the Jewish way of looking at the scripture is to keep finding these links, these different word associations. And shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you. And now he's very much into Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. But he's put together... The opening of Isaiah 62, 11, the opening statement there with uh, the part of Zechariah 9 in order to put it all together into one. But actually, he then does something else because the, the next bit in Zechariah chapter 9, see your king comes to you righteous and victorious. And Matthew decides, well, I'll, I'll miss that bit out because actually my focus is on gentle, or as it says in Zechariah, lowly and riding on a donkey. What Matthew is trying to do here is link this in to the, the king riding on a donkey. Now, I wouldn't say, you know, that um, anybody reading this would probably know that Zechariah also said righteous and victorious, or righteous and having salvation. So that almost is implied, if you like, but that's not Matthew's emphasis what is he trying to do here? He's trying to show the contrast and the unexpected situation of a humble king riding on a lowly donkey. Now, uh, these quotations that Matthew uses usually go backwards to what has just been said. This took place to fulfill. Now, in which case, then, this seems a little bit out of place because the actual entry comes much later, a little bit later in the chapter, because the disciples then go and do this. So actually what Matthew is referring to here with this took place is the instructions of Jesus to the disciples about going and finding a donkey in the first place. It's the fact that Jesus said, go and do this, that Matthew finds interesting and wants to link it in to this uh, prophecy in Zechariah. It's almost as though he's saying, realize that Jesus consciously here fulfilled what was going to happen by deliberately staging his entry in this fashion. And that's a very good point to bring out of that, that Jesus here must have known what he was doing, what he was suggesting, and its link back to Zechariah. He was aware of the prophet in this case. Now, there's something else that's a bit interesting and strange here, and that is how many animals are there? Because Jesus says you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt 
by her. What do you find in Zechariah? It says that the king will come riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, all that in the sort of poetic way in which it's expressed might just be one animal. A donkey? What kind of donkey? Oh, it's a colt. It's the foal of another donkey. You can't tell from Zechariah whether there's one animal or two. And in fact, all the other three gospel writers only mention one, which is a colt. That's in Mark and Luke and John. Matthew here is making it very clear that Jesus is actually finding, we're getting the disciples to find, both a donkey and the colt and tie them and bring them to me. So that's obviously what happened. There were two animals. The other gospel writers have decided to just tell us about one. Uh, but what Matthew is doing is bringing Zechariah's uh, poetic form of these things uh, and making it clear, well, actually, when it came to Jesus, there were two uh, animals. And historically, that's what happened. But of course, you can only ride one at a time. Otherwise, you've got the very strange sort of picture of Jesus trying to ride a donkey and a colt at the same time. And of course, he doesn't. Uh, but what it actually says in verse uh, six onwards, that they went and did exactly as Jesus instructed them. They brought two animals and placed their cloaks on them. So both the animals had cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Now, as I just said, uh, you can't sit on two animals at the same time. But what the other gospel writers bring out is that Jesus actually, you can put cloaks on both of them, by the way, uh, and you can put more than one cloak on each one. So when it says Jesus uh, sat on them, this is on the cloaks, not the two animals, but the cloaks that were placed particularly on the cult, which is what the other gospel writers uh, do. <clears throat> so the best way to think about this is that both animals have got cloaks on them. Jesus sits obviously on one animal, the cult, and if you like, a mother came too. The donkey, uh, mother donkey, also came as well. And that's because this cult had never been ridden before. And actually, I think what's happening here is that if you just go and fetch the colt by itself, it's going to be frightened and the mother is going to wonder what's going to happen. So actually, both had to come uh, together because the colt was not yet used to being ridden and particularly ridden through a very noisy crowd with lots of things going on. The mother was there, if you like, to reassure the colt and make sure that things happened properly. So that's the likely scenario that Jesus is actually riding on the colt and the mother uh, is walking alongside. And then, as you know, the entry takes place with the Hoshana to the son of David uh, and the whole city is stirred and so on. So that, I think, explains a bit about why Matthew has picked out, well, let's say a couple of things here, one from Isaiah, another one from Zechariah, in order to show very specifically that Jesus planned this and he did it, not only to fulfill the scripture, but also to demonstrate who he was as the humble king of coming to them and riding on the colt of the donkey that was there as well. And I want to finish by just sharing something separate on Palm Sunday, which I've, I've done several times, but it's always worth hearing uh, the same thing again uh, times in order to understand what's going on. The, we said from, from this reading and from what we've seen elsewhere, all this was very carefully planned. It was very purposeful. And for some time, Jesus had known that this was coming. Weeks ago, he deliberately set out for Jerusalem, knowing that it would be his last time there. And by the time he rides in on this particular day, it's as though he'd been travelling there in his mind and in his spirit for several weeks, maybe even months. And he knew that he was going there for Passover uh, in order to die, and that was his time. But why did he choose to ride in to Jerusalem, not just in that particular way, but on that particular day, in that particular time. Obviously, uh, one reason is that he wanted to allow enough time for other things to happen before Passover itself. 
he was coming in a few days early because lots of other things were going to happen. He was going to do lots of teaching. It was the preparation that was necessary for his actual sacrifice. It's like it mirrors the way the Passover lamb was selected ahead of its actual uh, sacrifice itself, and it was brought into the house, and it was examined by the uh, the family, and it was being looked after and prepared for something special to happen. And it's as though Jesus wasn't just going to turn up the day before, but he was coming into Jerusalem early in preparation. And he chose to come in on that particular day um, for many good reasons. But one that's often missed is that he probably wanted to make a bigger statement on that day than he could make at any other time. He, he was trying to make a big contrast between what he was doing and something else. Because around that time, and I can't be sure whether it was the same day, immediately before or after, but there would be another procession which would enter Jerusalem at around this time of year. So Jesus came in on a donkey from the east, but another procession would come into Jerusalem from the west that was very different, very powerful, very majestic, and it was the army of Rome. It was Pilate coming to Jerusalem with his troops for the Passover, not to celebrate Passover, of course, but to make sure that order was controlled. Now, when Pilate and the Roman army came in, of course, what would that be? Anything like this? No, it would be horses, it would be marching, it would be uh, full armour and shields and so on, trumpets, flags waving and so on, and probably the great flag, uh, so the great symbol of Rome, the golden eagle, uh, held up on a pole and on the banners and so on. And when this procession came into Jerusalem, uh, the Roman army would also have prisoners in chains at the back. Perhaps a few zealots, a few traitors, as examples to illustrate that they really were in charge. And as they marched in to Jerusalem, they would probably pass a small hill just outside the city, a place of execution for traitors, where the wooden posts were already hammered into the ground, waiting the next display of crucifixion, which was a permanent reminder and warning that Rome was in charge. And if you decide to rebel in any way, that's where you'll end up. So that procession was a proclamation of power, of imperial power, a statement of omnipotence intended to intimidate the Jewish people with its explicit message, do not challenge us or we will crush you. And we see time and again today in the world, don't we, massive demonstrations of power, whether it's um, massing of warships or planes or armies parading in various places just to demonstrate what they're capable of. And Pilate, the Roman governor at the time, uh, did not live in Jerusalem. He had a nice place of his own out on the coast at a place called Caesarea Maritima. Uh, but at certain times, he would have to come into Jerusalem, as I said, especially when the place would be packed for feasts such as Passover. And the Romans knew the significance of Passover. It was a celebration of deliverance of a minority group from a major imperial power, Egypt. And they knew, therefore, that there was a sort of revolutionary uh, air about the whole thing, with the huge crowds and the themes and the emotions and so on. If there was ever going to be an uprising against Rome, this would be most likely when it happened. And a mighty empire like Rome would understand that and know how to deal with it. They were prepared. So in would come all these reinforcements of troops with Pilate himself making a big show in order to stay at the Fortress Antonia, a garrison next to the temple complex. And here was this massive reinforcement and big demonstration. And people were expected to go out to the city gates and so on and greet, welcome almost, uh, this display of Roman power. They had to cheer and uh, probably had no bow or submit themselves in some way to show where, what their allegiance uh, was like. So I wonder if Jesus was offering a, a second alternative here, something very different, maybe at the same time or just afterwards or just before, in order to give people a choice. Are you going to come and cheer the Romans or me? Are you going to 
be linked in with the great imperial power? Is that your understanding of, of the kingdom and what God is doing? Or do you understand it differently in the way that I'm showing by coming to you riding on a donkey and coming to submit to the power of Rome and even die for your on your behalf? So I think Palm Sunday is a very significant statement. It's not just, well, he had to come at some time and look, he chose to do it on a donkey. I think he was giving people a clear choice at this point as to who they wanted to follow, who they really wanted to cheer and what it meant to them for their king to come riding on a donkey in the way that he did. So that's uh, covered what, what I wanted to do this time, uh, looking back at the uh, first of these quotations and what it meant for Matthew to say, Jesus is your Emmanuel, because just like it was in Isaiah's time, when you feel threatened, when you feel as though you don't know whether God is with you or not, then you can now rest assured because what happened then with a, in a very short, simple way back in the 8th century has now happened with Jesus as a true fulfilment that will go on all the way through now because even when he left them at the end, at the end of the gospel, he was their Emmanuel from that point onwards, which is what we read about in Acts and so on. But in order to fulfil all of that as well, he had to come into Jerusalem at this particular time and in this particular way, and show who he really was as our saviour and our king, as well as our Emmanuel. So that's me done for today. Um, some more next time where we'll look at uh, some of the other quotations that Matthew uses uh, before we get towards this, uh, the, the end of the gospel. There's plenty in the middle to look at as well. OK, I'll finish there and, and hand back. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. How absolutely fascinating. I don't think I'd ever heard before about um, Pilate coming in in a sort of triumphal entry from the opposite side. And, uh, amazing, really. It's a, a complete conflict of powers, isn't it? Um, yes, I mean, it speaks to us today, doesn't it? Which power are we going to choose? The secular power that is so strong or god's power so let's let's just offer that up in, in prayer actually before we go on to declare our faith in the risen lord jesus father god we just thank you that you speak to us lord through the bible through events through creation and thank you that uh, lord you are spelling out to us in all that happens, Lord, the spiritual realities that are going on in this world. And thank you for your assurance in all of this, that you are with us, God, with us. Lord, and all that is going on now, Lord, with the, the rise in power, of the earthly powers, the arrogance of these earthly powers, the conflict that we see all around. Thank you for that assurance that we see in Jesus on the cult, that you are here, that your power is, and that nothing and no one can stand against you. So, Lord, guide us in this time when we see the rise of earthly powers and the chaos that comes with that. Strengthen us to stand in your spirit in the full assurance of faith and strengthen us to proclaim your glory and your name. Amen. And let us now declare our faith in our Saviour who rode into Jerusalem and who died on the cross for us. And we use the Apostles' Creed this morning. So we say together, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is our faith, and on this we stand. So now I'm going to invite Peggy to come and lead us in our prayers, please. Thank you, Linda. Uh, so let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you this day with hearts full of praise, gladness and thankfulness for who you are, the ever-living and ever-loving creator of the universe. Lord God, we acknowledge the privilege we have of naming you as our Father, you who are the Father of our Lord and Saviour, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah of Israel. Only because of the shedding of his own sinless blood on that cross on Calvary, which paid the price for all the sin of all the human race, Thus, we, who wholeheartedly trust in his wonderful work of redemption, are also able to call you our Father. What grace, what faithfulness and what great mercy was shown to the human race by the willingness of Jesus to lovingly fulfil the requirements of our sins and disobedience. Our thankful hearts, full of love, ring out to you, our glorious and victorious Redeemer. Hallelujah. So with full hearts, we would ask that you who reigns over all the earth would hear our supplications and hearken to our prayers this day. Father God, we are your people, grafted into the vine of your called out nation the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, trusting that it's not too presumptuous, we echo the beginning of the prayer of Daniel. O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly, and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. O oh, Father God, we bear not only our own sin, but also that of our nation. We confess to the unrighteousness of our nation, especially acknowledging the murder of millions of unborn babies, lives gifted by you, only to be thrown away as trash. We humbly and contritely beg your forgiveness, O God. A further attack on our children and youth is the deliberate sexualization and gender confusion allowed and even encouraged by our education system. O oh, Father of all, we plead for you to forgive us and ask that you would not only bring these young minds into a right and wholesome way of thinking, but you would also thoroughly cleanse our education system. Much of this social dysphoria is felt by parents, teachers and many people in their various workplaces. But such is the abusive trend of the influences in society that many ordinary folk are afraid to voice their concerns. Oh, Father God, 
Where are the right-thinking leaders in our nation? Where indeed are the right, righteous voices from within your church? We are totally without excuse. O oh Lord God, righteous judge, we are reaping what we have sown. You are the just judge. We can only beg for mercy. So we would bring before your throne the three pillars of our democracy this day. Firstly, the church. Thank you, precious Lord, that your word is taught and propagated in our land, but not as universally as it once was. We confess that frequently the word of truth is replaced with the thinking of man, causing not only distortion, but also much confusion amongst many congregations. We do give you thanks and all the glory for all the congregations where your word is preached and upheld, especially this one. Secondly, our monarchy. Since the death of our previous monarch, Queen Elizabeth, there has been a subtle change. It would seem your Holy Spirit has moved out and we are left without his influence within our palace walls. Our nation and the monarchy itself are currently struggling. We confess we are lacking that perfect peace that passes all understanding. So, Almighty God, we bring before you King Charles, Queen Camilla and the Prince and Princess of Wales, asking that they might each be enlightened by the knowledge of the redemptive work of your Son, the Lord Jesus, bringing light, peace and enrichment into their personal lives, but also to the nation as a whole. We would also ask for your healing touch upon our King and especially upon the young mother, Princess Catherine. And thirdly, our government. Here again, Almighty God, there appears to be much disorder, division and unrighteousness. If a house is divided against itself, that house shall not stand. Father God, we have elections. Possibly as early as May, we beg that your hand would be the one guiding all the ballots. Without your mercy, Lord, how shall our nation stand? We are inundated with illegal immigrants, many of whom are here with evil intents. Others are swept into, the, into slave labour. Yet, our government speaks much about this, but seems powerless to act. O oh Lord, you are the one who sees and knows all things. Please be merciful in your judgments. Yes, Lord, we deserve judgment, but please show us mercy. Lastly, but certainly not the least important in our prayers, is the need to confess our historic and even current double dealing in our national thinking and behaviour toward your chosen people and land, Israel. The subtle, but oft times not so subtle, anti-Semitic diatribes that come forth from the media our national public broadcaster, and occasionally even from the House of Westminster, are certainly causes of great offence to our hearts. And oh, oh, God of Israel, they might even be called blasphemous. We repent on behalf of our nation, asking your forgiveness, and again plead for your mercy. 
I would particularly lift to you our foreign office and its current leadership, which is very much against Israel on many issues, but particularly her right to defend herself. We are acting arrogantly against your people and her sovereign rights to protect them. O oh, judge of all the earth, forgive us and show us your mercy, despite our having none to offer Israel. Gracious Father, there are followers of Jesus in our land who love and faithfully pray for your land and people. Our own fellowship is counted in that number, and we read and believe your word that your covenants with Abraham and his descendants are an everlasting yea and amen. We lift up the government of Israel, the war cabinet, and especially her prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, and pray for your wisdom, strength, and protection upon them. And Lord God of Israel, we thank you for the courage, audacity, and resilience of all the commanders and soldiers of the IDF. May you be their shield and strong right arm in their goings out and comings in, especially in this time of war. Help us too, Father God, to support them correctly with our prayers. Especially we bring before you the hostages being held in Gaza. Please make your presence known to them through the coming days. Fill them with your hope and keep them safe, because you are a loving and gracious God. And this day is the Feast of Purim, when we remember, Lord God, the victory you gave to the Israelites following the three days of prayer and fasting called by Queen Esther. And so, Lord God, we are confident that all your plans and purposes are being worked out perfectly, as in the past, so also at this time. Hallelujah to the Almighty, the God of yesterday, today, and eternity. We give you everlasting Father in the name of our Saviour and Emmanuel all the glory, honour, and praise for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Peggy. And now let's gather together all our prayers and the words that Jesus himself taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So now we come to that point in our service where we're going to bring before the Lord any known to us at this time, especially who are in need, who are unwell maybe, who are anxious, who are struggling under burdens that they find it difficult to, to carry. I'm going to invite you to uh, unmute in just a second and to speak out their names before the Lord, that together we might uphold all those for whom we ask the Lord's touch. So we bring to the Lord the sick and suffering, those who are heavy laden, those who mourn and grieve, those who are weary, tired, anxious. None of their needs go unnoticed by our God. So may the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ bless and restore all these troubled in body, mind or spirit, that we now name before him. Our God is a God of power. 
who loves us, who hears our prayers, and whose will is that we might be whole in every way. So we know now that he has heard our prayers. And we say, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Spirit, may God in his perfect compassion restore all these we have named, both aloud and in our hearts, and speedily send them complete healing of soul and body. Let healing come speedily, and let us all say, Amen. So as we draw towards the end of our service together, we're going to have another time of worship. And I invite Jane to come and lead us, please. remains now is to give the blessing and dismissal. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace this day and throughout the coming week. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And we say together, in the name of Christ, amen.